It is a very great pleasure to have Dan McDonald here today. He doesn't really need an introduction, but uh, there might be one or two who don't know him. Daniel is a professor at the Australian National University in Canberra, where he runs a very large team. I don't know how many of staff and students. Um, Dan is really a, a world-renowned expert on uh, defect characterization in silicon, recently I think with a strong emphasis on n-type but he also knows a lot about silicon solar cells and uh, that is the topic uh, of his talk today. We both attended a workshop in the US a couple of weeks ago and um, Dan gave this outstanding talk which addressed one of my fundamental questions which was is there actually a difference fundamentally between a top con contact and a heterojunction contact? Um, I guess Peter Werfel would say they're both just two different flavors of the same thing which is like a membrane or a carrier selective contact but I'm sure Daniel will tell us more about that. So thank you very much, Dan, and we look forward to your talk. Lovely. <coughs> Thanks, Torsten, for the nice introduction and for inviting me to come along today. It's really a, a pleasure to be here and to see so many people who I know. Um, yeah, so as Torsten said, I'm going to be talking about um, a comparison really between polysilicon contacts and amorphous silicon contacts. And uh, looking at how these two passivating contact technologies can enable us to achieve, I think, above 26% solar cells in mass production within the next few years, which is really quite an amazing statement to be able to make, <laughs> considering where we were three or four years ago. But I, I think it's quite realistic. Um, so I'll, I'll get straight into it. Uh, many of you will be, know, be familiar with this um, roadmap uh, graph from the IT RPV roadmap. Um, in orange here, um, I've got the P-type PERC cell, uh, which currently dominates uh, the international market uh, in 2022. But as you can see, the projection is for uh, N-topcon and silicon heterojunctions to, to eat away at that market share over the next five to ten years. And actually, from, from information I've seen and, and recent talks I've seen, I think this, this uh, this um, transition will probably happen a lot quicker than is shown on this graph. Uh, and the fundamental reason for that is that P-type PERC technology is limited to, say, a maximum of around 24%. Uh, and that's, that's because of the contact recombination, the, the direct contact between metal and the heavily doped silicon. And that's a fundamental limitation on the voltage on these devices. So uh, PERC will be replaced at probably an increasingly fast rate over the next few years, both by N-topcon, which uses polycrystalline silicon contacts, and silicon heterojunctions, which use amorphous silicon uh, contacts. Both of them uh, clearly have the potential to achieve above 20 25% in production. They've already, that's already been demonstrated, and I'll show you some recent results. Uh, and I think they can go above 26% as well. Uh, if you look at the projections here on the roadmap, you can see that TopCon is expected to take market share quicker than heterojunctions, and indeed that's what's happening uh, now. And basically the reason for that is that it's much more compatible with the, today's PERC technology, and the capital costs for setting up a TopCon line are a lot lower than the heterojunction line, around two to three times lower. So that's really decisive. <coughs> But what, what I'd like to look at in this talk is which of these two technologies, TopCon or Heterojunction, has the, the best prospects in the long run uh, to, to provide the highest efficiency cells, single junction silicon cells in mass production. Okay, so firstly I'd like to take a look at what the fundamental differences are between these two types of technology. And, and Torsten was alluding to the fact that it's not always clear. Uh, for me, I think one of the, the critical differences is, or really the fundamental difference is the type of interlayer that's used on the passivating contact. So on the left we have an N-type TopCon device, N-type wafer. On the rear we have the, the passivating contact with the very thin oxide interlayer. It's usually about one and a half nanometers thick. And then an N-plus polysilicon layer on top of that, um, which provides good electrical contact. The oxide interlayer provides the surface passivation. Uh, and that gives a really low recombination current on the rear side. Uh, and on the front side, it, it's more traditional. We have um, 
a selective boron diffusion, a heavy diffusion under the fingers, that's what we call the P++, and then the P plus diffusion, a light boron diffusion between the fingers uh, with a dielectric stack on top. Um, as opposed to a heterojunction, which most of you be very familiar with already, where we have on both surfaces an intrinsic amorphous silicon layer, again very thin, and then on top of that on the front side a, an N-type dope layer, and on the rear side a P-type dope layer, and a TCO on top of those for um, conduction. So that's one really important difference between the two technologies. Topcon has an oxide interlayer and heterojunction has an intrinsic amorphous silicon interlayer. And as a result of that, um, we have another important distinction between the two technologies and that's the process temperature. So for a Topcon, the, the oxide is often grown at high temperature and the polysilicon layer has to be doped, crystallised and activated at high temperature. So we have to go above 800 degrees for a Topcon contact. So it's, it's essential to use high temperature process steps at some point with the Topcon. Whereas heterojunction is exactly the opposite. We can't go above 250 degrees, otherwise we'll crystallise that uh, amorphous silicon interlayer and uh, we'll lose the surface passivation. The Topcon cell, you might have noticed already, is not really a, a double passivating contact cell because the front side contact is a traditional diffused contact. So we really only have a passivating contact on the rear. Whereas for the heterojunction, we have passivating contacts on both surfaces. So it is a more complete passivating contact device in that sense. Um, however, for the Topcon cell where we have um, the diffused front side, that does give us some advantages in terms of the optics because it's very transparent. The dielectric stack has very little um, parasitic absorption in it, so we get very good currents with Topcon cells. But because we have the high recombination under the contacts, we, we suffer in terms of voltage. Um, heterojunctions, on the other hand, because they have this uh, TCO and doped silicon layer on the front, do, do suffer from parasitic absorption. Another important distinction is the Topcon cell is a front junction device and heterojunction cells are almost always rear junction devices and that has some important consequences for the fill factor, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and also, uh, finally, the Topcon cell has a rear planar surface. It's not textured as opposed to heterojunction. And that's not a coincidence um, because it's rather difficult to get a very low recombination current on a textured surface with polysilicon films as opposed to amorphous silicon films which give amazing passivation on both planar and textured surfaces. Okay, so um, next up I want to just run through some typical cell parameters for these two types of technologies. So in the table here I've got two entries for Topcon. The first one in bold is the industry state-of-the-art range. So this is a number of full-size cells that have been reported recently. So I've given a range for the currents, VOC, fill factor and efficiency. Likewise, I've shown a similar range of sort of state-of-the-art industrial cells for heterojunctions in the third row. And then for both Topcon and heterojunction, I've shown the recent champions cells. Um, so sort of standout examples. The Topcon champion cell is from Jinko, 25.4% uh, cell. And of course, the, the, the best heterojunction cell is from Longji, just published recently, an amazing 26.8% cell. Uh, and um, thanks to those guys at Longji who published a lovely paper with all of the parameters that you need to do a complete model of that cell using, um, for example, we use Quokka 3 to simulate it. We're able to sort of uh, simulate that device very completely and um, we've done that in this work. We've also done the same thing for the Jinko cell because we work closely with Jinko. So what you'll see in the rest of this talk is a comparison of those Quokka simulations of the two champion cells. So just to, to point out what most of you would already know very well, I'm sure, um, you can see the lower JSCs in the heterojunction cells uh, compared to Topcons. Um, about a milliamp less. That's because of the parasitic absorption in the TCOs and the amorphous films on the front. Got a lower VOC in Topcon than heterojunction, about 30, 20 to 30 millivolts lower. And that's because of recombination at the front side, particularly under the metal contacts. 
And we do have a lower fill factor in Topcon cells. And uh, as you'll see later on, um, that's almost entirely due to lateral transport losses on the front surface through the, the light boron diffusion. So what I'm, what I'm wanting to do today uh, is basically dig into these losses in a bit more detail, understand where they come from and their magnitudes. And then based on that, we'll try and evaluate what the prospects are for these two technologies uh, to achieve above 26% in mass production uh, at, at low cost. Okay, so let's take a look at the optical losses first. Um, on the left here, I've shown the Champion Topcon cell from Jinko, 25.4% uh, and, and our own analysis of the optical losses there. On the right is the Longji silicon heterojunction cell and I've taken numbers from their recent um, Nature paper, uh, Nature Energy paper about that device. And uh, I haven't shown all the optical losses here, for example, infrared escape, because uh, a little bit complicated to unpack that. But what I have shown here is what I've called the primary avoidable optical losses. So ones that you could hope to reduce by improving the technology in some way. Um, okay, so uh, you can see on the left, sorry, I'll just go back a bit. On the left, breaking it down a bit, um, you can see we have reflection from the metal fingers on the front. Uh, it's about 0.6 milliamps for the uh, top con, a little higher for Heterojunction, this is really just to do with the optimization of uh, the metallization. Front reflection uh, from the front surface, excluding the fingers, is about the same for both technologies. But the big difference is absorption in the front stack. It's only 0.4 milliamps for Topcon and it's over 1 milliamp for uh, the heterojunction. And let me add that this is for the 26.8% device from Longji, which is much, much better than the typical heterojunction cell in terms of its front side optics because they've developed really nice TCOs and more transparent um, amorphous silicon oxide layer. So uh, I think a typical heterojunction cell would be almost twice that in terms of front side uh, absorption. Um, interestingly, the rear side absorption is about the same for both. Uh, about 0.3 milliamps for the top con and about, about the same uh, for the heterojunction. So this is a loss for Topcon, this absorption in the relatively thick poly layer on the rear side, it's about 100 nanometers thick. That's something we can improve on. So a lot of parasitic absorption in the front stack, that's the primary difference in terms of the optical losses. And the parasitic absorption at the rear is, is quite similar for both. Okay, so that's the optics. Let's have a look at recombination. And the best way to look at surface passivation, which is of course, an important source of recombination is to, I think, think about J noughts. Um, and this is quite a striking side-by-side -side comparison, I think. If you look at the J naught values on the heterojunction, on the front surface, it's one femtoamp, even under the contacts. And on the rear surface, it's half a femtoamp uh, under the contacts as well, because the TCO um, persists under the contact. So there's no direct contact between the metal uh, and the and the amorphous silicon layer. Um, on the other hand, the Topcon cell is not quite as good. The polysilicon layer on the back is good, two femtoamps, that's enough to get you close to 750 millivolts. Uh, but unfortunately, where we, we make contact with the screen printed metallization, it does degrade the oxide passivation a bit. The, the J naught goes up to 50. On the front, this is the real killer. We've got 500 femtoamps under the fingers even if that's only a couple of percent of the area fraction, that's enough to limit our voltage to 720 millivolts or, or a little bit higher. So that's why we, we always see a voltage deficit uh, for Topcon compared to heterojunction. It's, it, it's because the J naught values are higher and in particular the J naught values uh, on the front side under the contact. Um, I think it's really amazing to, to just stop and uh, admire the fact that they could achieve half a femtoamp on a textured surface. Um, that gives you an implied voltage of, well, probably well above 750 millivolts. Um, and to be able to do that on a textured surface is really quite incredible. I don't think that um, polysilicon contacts will ever be able to get that good. Um, 
but maybe they'll get close enough that it won't matter. Okay, so let's take a look at bulk recombination losses. We've just looked at surface, but of course, for these very high efficiency cells, we need an exceptional bulk lifetime as well. Uh, and this is the quokka modeling that we reverse engineered on the, um, on the silicon heterojunction cell here, the dashed lines. This is our quokka modeling of the Jinko Topcon cell for different resistivities. Uh, you don't need to read all the legend details here, but the takeaway point is that for these two technologies to reach their um, potential VOC of around 720 and 750, we need bulk lifetimes that are at least 5 to 10 milliseconds. Um, otherwise, we're, we're not getting the most out of our device architecture. Uh, in, the, in the two papers which have been published on these champion cells, of course, the bulk lifetime is one of the input parameters into the quokka modeling. And for the Topcon cell, 15 milliseconds was used. And for the, the heterojunction cell, 25 milliseconds, um, which is essentially means that there is no defect related recombination at all. That's far above the, the OJ limit in, in that resistivity. So I should, I should be clear that those lifetimes are the Shockley Reed Hall lifetimes, not the effective lifetimes. So, you know, a big question is, can that be done easily in practice? Uh, so we, we wanted to try and understand that a little better. So we took a, a standard N-type CZ ingot grown for the PV industry, uh, and we measured the bulk lifetime in the as-grown state, that's the, the gray data here, by using a super acid passivation, so without any high temperature treatments. This is the effective lifetime in microseconds as a function of solidified fraction. So this is the top of the ingot, uh, this is the bottom of the ingot. And then you can see that the lifetime was around one to two milliseconds. After phosphorus scattering, it jumps up a lot um, to between four and, and six milliseconds. Um, so even though these are really high quality N-type ingots, they still respond very well to, to removal of metal impurities by gettering. And if we reframe those results in terms of implied VOC at one sun, you can see that the implied voltage jumps from about 725 up to almost 740 millivolts. So if you were making heterojunction cells from these wafers, it would be essential to do a pre-gettering step. Otherwise you're throwing away 20 or 30 millivolts. Fortunately for the Topcom process, the gettering is already embedded. So the, the, the um, activation and doping of the polysilicon film is an extremely effective gettering step and it removes more than 99% of mobile impurities like iron from the wafers. But of course for heterojunctions, which is low temperature, we can't have a gettering step during the device fabrication. So actually it turns out, and I, I didn't really know this until just recently, that all of the heterojunction manufacturers are now using a pre-gettering step where they, they do a phosphorus diffusion, etch it off, and then they put the cells into the fab. Uh, so that was a, something that I only learned at the silicon workshop <laughs> that Torsten and I were at recently. Uh, so I think that's quite interesting. Um, just quick little aside here. We were interested to know what are these metals that are being removed in N-type silicon. Um, unfortunately, we can't use our favorite technique of breaking iron boron or iron gallium pairs, um, which we've used for many years for P-type silicon. It's a really nice method for identifying iron, uh, but because this is N-type, we can't do that. Um, so we kind of didn't think we'd be able to, to identify these impurities because they're at extremely low concentrations. There's no hope to do it with, with sims or anything like that. But after a discussion with Ron Sinton a few years ago, we realized there could be a nice way to do it. What we, what we looked at actually is the rate at which the lifetime increases as the impurities are removed from the wafer through gettering. So we applied a gettering layer to the surface. In this case, it was uh, aluminum oxide and annealed the samples at around 400 degrees for some hours. And during that time, the impurities are mobile they move to the surface and are extracted from the wafer. If you then measure the lifetime, the lifetime increases. This is the apparent defect density plotted as a function of time. It decreases opposite to the lifetime. 
and you can see that it follows, the data follows what we would expect for iron extremely closely. This wafer on the left is a sample which we implanted with iron, so we expect it <laughs> to, to follow the iron curve. Uh, so that was kind of a test to see if the technique works. When we then applied the same approach to some n-type wafers from the ingot I've just shown you, uh, from the PV industry, we found similar kinetics. So that the, the diffusivity of iron fitted these curves really well. So what we were able to conclude from that is that iron is probably still the most important metal impurity, even in n-type silicon, and that it's still there in reasonably high concentrations. We were able to estimate between 10 to the 11 and 10 to the 12. Uh, which um, is, you know, um, fairly high. Uh, and in a P-type ingot, that would be very detrimental uh, to the lifetime. But in N-type, because of the capture cross-section asymmetry of iron, it's not such a big problem. OK, so that's recombination. We've done optics. We've done recombination. Now I want to look at the last one, transport losses. Uh, and I'm only going to look at lateral resistance here because the other um, fill factor losses, if you like, are not really that significant. Um, so if we look at the sheet resistances on the two devices, again another side-by-side -side comparison with Topcon on the left, heterojunction on the right. Again, this is the Champion cell from Longji. They have a high mobility uh, TCO, which enables them to get a sheet resistance of only 50, uh, 50 ohms per square, which is really low on the front, and about 40 on the rear. So that gives fantastic lateral transport. Um, that, those values are much lower than typical heterojunction cells, which are usually above 100. So uh, that's, this is the reason why they got such a high fill factor, essentially, of 86. Um, whereas the Topcon Champion cell, it's not as good. So on the rear, it's not too bad, 90 ohms per square. That's probably not going to be limiting. Uh, but on the front, between the fingers, we have 200 ohms per square, uh, as opposed to 50, and that's giving us a very uh, significant restriction on lateral transport. Uh, unfortunately, we can't reduce that sheet resistance very much <laughs> because if we do, then we pay for it in terms of recombination uh, and our voltage goes down at the expense of increasing the fill factor. So we're kind of in a, a bit of a bind. Uh, there's another important point here uh, which I wanted to make about transport losses in the two devices. So because the, the heterojunction device is a rear junction device, the wafer itself contributes to transport to the front fingers. Uh, that's that's um, n-type, the same as the n-type uh, amorphous layer on the front. So we've got the sheet resistance from the amorphous layer in TCO, plus in parallel another conduction path from the wafer itself which is about 50 ohms per square too. So we've got really fantastic transport to the front contacts in the heterojunction cell. On the other hand, for the top con cell, all of the carriers that go to the front contacts have to pass through that really uh, not very conductive uh, P plus boron diffusion. Uh, and as a result, um, we get significant impact on the fill factor. We don't have the benefits of the wafer adding to the transport to the front contacts because it's a front junction device. Now, just looking at fill factors a little bit more. Um, of course, when you have a higher VOC, you will get a higher fill factor. That's really just a consequence of the shape of IV curves, in a sense. Um, so you could say, well, maybe the higher fill factor in the, in the heterojunction cell is because it has a higher voltage, um, but that's not the case. What I've plotted here is the ideal fill factor, FF0, based on um, an old paper of Martin's um, looking at fundamental fill factor uh, values for an ideality factor of 1. And you can see it has a fairly weak dependence on voltage compared to the difference in VOC of the two devices. So this is not the only reason or even the main reason for the, the difference in fill factor. Um, so, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, we're, we're certain that, in fact, the higher fill factor for the heterojunction is caused by improved transport to the front fingers, uh, and I'll show you that in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, the other interesting thing here is that the, the long G cell is actually above uh, 
the fill factor that you should be able to achieve with ideality one. Uh, in red here, we've got the ideality factor at the OJ limit, when the ideality, sorry, the fill factor, uh, ideal fill factor at the OJ limit, when the ideality factor is two thirds. And you can see that the Longy cell is moving in that direction. And perhaps one day, when we have a truly OJ limited device, we'll see some fill factors up around 88%. Okay, so we've been through the optical recombination and transport losses. What does that tell us about how these devices could perform in industry? Um, for heterojunction cells, we've already seen a number of examples of large area cells above 26%. So it's clear that the technology can achieve that, even above 26.5. But there are some really big challenges for heterojunction, not to do with the device architecture, or the passivation or the quality of the technology, but to do with costs. So the capital costs are around two to three times higher. Um, that's really a killer. Uh, when you're depreciating your equipment over a period of three to five years, which is typical in industry now, um, that can be quite, quite a significant factor. Um, can they come down with scale? Um, possibly, I mean, the heterojunction industry is not as big as the Topcon one at the moment, so perhaps if they were the same size, equipment costs would come down. But the difference in scale <coughs> currently isn't that big. It's only a factor of maybe three or four, and it's hard to see the costs coming down by, <coughs> by enough to really make a difference uh, in terms of the equipment costs. The other issue that heterojunctions have is the TCO layers are almost always made with indium which is a scarce resource and will become more and more expensive. So it's going to be necessary to um, find new TCA, TCOs, which are just as good in terms of their transparency and mobility as the indium-based ones, but, but using other materials. That's not an easy uh, thing to, to resolve. And as we saw, it's important to, to add pre-gettering, which is not a problem, it can be done, but it, it is another process step. So those are the challenges for heterojunction cells. Um, for Topcon cells, they have not achieved so many results above 26%. So I think we, we can dig a little bit more into what would be required there. <coughs> there have been some reports of devices above 26% for Topcon. Uh, this table shows champion cells reported by Jinko over the last couple of years. Uh, we work quite closely with Jinko on their Topcon technology, but we only really have proper data for the first two. So we've been able to do Quokka analysis on those two. We, we don't really have uh, detailed enough data on these more recent ones to be able to unpack uh, where the losses are there. So I, I can't really comment much on those, but looking at the 25.4% champion cell, if we, if we look at where the losses are, it helps us to see where we can go next. So these are based on Quokka 3 simulations. You can see that almost all the electrical losses, or the, the majority of them are on the front side. So here in green, these are all losses on the front surface. Dark blue are power losses in the bulk, and light blue is um, power losses at the rear surface. 27% is the is the achievable efficiency after extract, after removing the optical losses. So this is only electrical losses here. And then we end up with a final efficiency of 25.4%. So you can see that the green ones dominate. The biggest one is P plus hole transport. That is the lateral conduction of holes to the front fingers that we were talking about before. Uh, that really hurts our fill factor. Uh, we have yeah, resistive losses in the P plus layer. We also still have a fair bit of recombination uh, between and under the contacts, and also some front surface contact resistance is still pretty significant. And unfortunately, if we try and improve one of those, inevitably we make one of the others worse. So we're kind of stuck in a bind. We've pretty much optimized that front selective boron emitter as far as it can go. And if you tweak one thing, you just lose somewhere else. Um, so it's, I think we've pretty much reached the limit of what we can do with that um, traditional uh, boron selective emitter. <coughs>
You can also see that there's still some recombination from bulk defects. Here, bulk recombination others. Um, so there's still some impact of defects in these wafers as well, even though they're n-type. Okay, um, so thinking about that, um, we wanted to think about what might come next for TopCon in order to achieve well above 26%. This is the standard TopCon technology which we've been talking about so far. Um, but one approach to improving it, which I think is nice, is to put P plus polysilicon contacts under the front side contacts. So we're removing the P plus plus boron diffusion and replacing it with a passivating contact with a, an oxide interlayer. Now, it's easy to draw this on a diagram <laughs> and to do a quokka simulation of it. Uh, actually figuring out a way to make it in, in industry is much more challenging. And um, uh, I'm sure that there are quite a lot of uh, R&D groups in industry that are trying this right now. Uh, I, I'm sure that there will be a way to do it. Uh, I don't know exactly what it will be yet, and that's not really my job, I think. <laughs> um, I think <coughs> what we've seen recently is that the ability of the R&D teams in industry is really extraordinary. They, the way they can solve problems like this is truly impressive. So I'm, I've got a lot of confidence that it will be possible to do this in a cost-effective way uh, in a pretty short period of time. Now, the beauty of this approach is all of a sudden it relaxes that bind that we were in, where we're trying to trade off recombination versus transport versus contact resistance with the selective emitter, all of a sudden we can move things around a lot more and optimise, and that gives us a higher voltage, probably up around 740 millivolts. But it does require us to put P plus poly on a textured surface, which is not an easy thing to do. I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so you might think, well, if you've gone to the trouble of developing a technology where you can localise polysilicon contacts, why not go all the way to an IBC cell? It's uh, got the obvious advantage of no shading on the front. The other huge advantage is now you have even more freedom in optimising your contacts in terms of their area fraction and their size, uh, because you don't have to worry about the optics so much on the rear side. And another really nice advantage for polysilicon is you can apply those layers on a planar rear surface, which um, is a big advantage in terms of the J0 values. But of course, it's more complex processing. There's risks of shunts. And uh, from what I've seen in industry, there's generally a bit of reluctance to move towards this kind of architecture uh, because of the, the process risks. They prefer to, to stick with the two-side contacted technology. Okay, let's just see how we're going for time. Not too bad. Um, so what we did was we thought, well, let's do a quokka model uh, where we put P plus poly under the fingers on our top con cell. So we took the, the champion cell from Jinko and we put P plus poly under the fingers in quokka. Uh, and what you can see is that all of a sudden this front contact recombination is essentially gone. Uh, we were also able to significantly reduce hole transport losses by re-optimising the, the metallisation on the front. Um, and uh, with a few other assumptions, such as no more defect, so you can see that bulk recombination others is now zero, um, which might sound pretty unrealistic, but some of the wafers we've been measuring lately, when you measure the effective lifetime, they're sitting right on the OJ limit. These are industrial wafers after applying a polysilicon contact, which gives very good gettering. Uh, we often see lifetimes which are, which are at the intrinsic limit. So <coughs> I think for N-type wafers, it's not unrealistic to think that quite soon they will essentially be defect free. We've got 20 micron fingers in the simulation, which is possible to do now with screen printing, or you could think about plating as well, of course. Um, and as a result, you can see that the voltage now is almost 740 millivolts, uh, and the fill factor's gone up too, and we're well above 26%, just by putting the P plus poly under the fingers, and a couple of other little 
little things as well. Um, so we think that's a viable approach um, to, to take Topcon Plus, if you like, technology well above 26%. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting to note is at these sort of voltages, it starts to make sense to think about Topcon cells for tandems uh, in competition with heterojunction, and I think that's something that we'll see more of in the future. I think it's inevitable that the VOC gap between Topcon and heterojunctions will continue to shrink. At the moment it's 20 to 30 millivolts. I reckon in a few years it'll only be 10 or 15 millivolts, and it'll probably get even less than that. Uh, so I think that, that could have some implications for tandems as well. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about today is the P plus polycontact. So the, the Topcon plus or next gen Topcon, if you like, architectures that we looked at all require P plus polysilicon contacts. The problem is that they're generally not as good as N plus polysilicon contacts in terms of surface recombination. So we characterize that with the J naught. Don't try and read all this stuff here. Sorry that this graph's busy. I've just taken it from one of our postdocs um, draft publications. Basically, I just want you to get the vibe. On the left is N plus polysilicon. On the right is P plus polysilicon. Using lots of different approaches to, to grow the oxide, introduce the dopants, um, crystallize the film. But generally speaking, you can see that the ones on the right are a bit higher than the ones on the left. And we, we always see that. Um, unfortunately, boron doped polysilicon contacts, the J noughts are generally a factor of three or four higher, which means a deficit of about 20 millivolts. That's why industrial Topcon cells use N plus poly and not P plus poly. It's one of the reasons. Unfortunately, that delta is even worse on textured surfaces. So this graph is slightly differently organized. We have N plus poly on the left. Um, Non-textured are the purple stars and textured are the red boxes. There's not a big difference, but for P plus poly, when we add texture, which are the red boxes, things get significantly worse. And um, now we have an even bigger voltage deficit of around 40 to 50 millivolts. So why is P plus poly always or almost always worse than N plus poly. Um, well, I think there, there's quite a lot of speculation and, and hypotheses about that in the literature. Uh, I think really one of the key points is to do with the solubility of those dopants. So we know that uh, phosphorus is more soluble in crystalline silicon than in silicon oxide. So that means when phosphorus meets an oxide, it'll tend to pile up there. It, it won't go into the oxide. And that's what you can see in this atom probe tomography data, which is taken from some work from colleagues of ours, which we're working on together at Sydney Uni in Simon Ringer's group. And you can see that the phosphorus atoms in yellow, they're just lined up, stacked on top of the oxide. They're not in the oxide. They're not going through the oxide. They're just piled up on the top. Whereas boron is exactly the opposite. It is more soluble in oxide than in silicon. So when it meets that oxide interface, it gets sucked into the oxide. Uh, and you can't really see the boron in the oxide layer because it's quite dilute, but you can see that it doesn't pile up at the interface. And that's because it's getting essentially dissolved into the interlayer, the oxide interlayer. And when the boron is in the oxide interlayer, it causes damage and defects. And that's why one of the reasons, I think, why we have uh, more recombination at P plus poly layers. You can imagine that that might be even worse on a textured surface where the oxide is locally a bit thin or a bit stressed. That makes it even easier for the boron to get in there and create damage. So a lot of people are looking at ways to resolve this problem. Instead of using an oxide interlay, you can use oxynitrides which um, have different solubility properties. Uh, you can try gallium doping, which has the same solubility properties as phosphorus. So it, it gives great J noughts, but unfortunately it's not very soluble in silicon, so it's hard to get a good um, contact resistance. Or you can move to pinhole oxides where you're not 
we're using thicker oxides that, which are much more resilient to boron damage. Okay, so in conclusion then, um, I think we can be pretty confident that both TopCon and heterojunction technologies can achieve above 26% in production. Um, for TopCon, reaching close to 26 will be possible with the current architecture shown up here, the standard N-type TopCon. But if we want to get up around 26.5 or higher, we're going to need to deploy P plus polysilicon contacts to increase the voltage. So that could be polysilicon under the fingers or IBC or even rear junction devices are interesting as well. Uh, for heterojunctions, they've already shown that 26.5% is possible with the current architecture. However, the capital costs are the, really the big barrier here and the development of cost-effective TCOs, which don't include indium. Um, okay, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Happy to take questions. I'll just wait till Rob brings the, the microphone over. Um, hi Dan, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, so for a single junction silicon solar cell, what do you think the ultimate ideal structure will be? Okay, that's a good question. Um, at the recent Colorado workshop where Torsten and I were, quite a few people are very strong proponents of the IBC cell. So some people are definitely in the IBC camp. Um, I can see the advantages of that, but I think that some of the other possibilities, uh, such as rear junction, I didn't talk much about rear junction cells, but they have an advantage in terms of fill factor. Um, so I, I think the jury's still out, or at least for me, I don't have a definite answer, but I'd, I'd say most people would probably say IBC. Dan, I've got two questions. We know solar cell is just half a story and it's not a real product. You have to encapsulate it into modules. So my question is, what is the comparative CDM between two technologies? And the second is the bifaciality difference. Okay, um, I don't think I can really say much about the cell to module losses. I don't know a lot about that. Um, but in terms of the bifaciality, um, definitely heterojunction has an advantage there because it has texturing on the rear side. So I think for heterojunction modules, the bifaciality is typically around 90%, whereas for TopCon, it's more like 80%. Um, I think in the long run, um, it might be necessary to have texturing on the rear side for TopCon cells as well, especially as wafers get thinner and thinner. Uh, at the moment in industry, they're you know, pushing down to around 120 microns and they'd love to go thinner because it saves them money. But once you get below 100 microns, you really start to lose current uh, if you don't have fantastic light trapping and that may mean texturing on the rear side will be necessary for TopCon as well. In which case it'll probably have better bifaciality or similar bifaciality to heterojunction. And my second question is, um, if iron is problematic, you have to um, get rid of it. Can you just have a better ingot formation like a wafer growing process to, to remove it in the first place? Um. Yes, you can, but how much will it cost? You know, that's, that's the question. Uh, I think, uh, it's, I guess it's not really ob clear at the moment where that small amount of iron is coming from in the ingot process, whether it's coming from the silicon feedstock or if it's coming from the crucibles. Uh, I don't think we really know that. Um, but for TopCon, it, it doesn't matter. Basically, that's what the conclusion here was. The iron gets sucked out by the poly layer anyway. So we don't need to worry about it. And for heterojunction, they just do a pre-gettering step, which I guess adds something to the cost. But I think that's going to be more cost effective than trying to remove iron from the, the ingot in the first place, which might require additional distillation steps in the semen, Siemens process, which is, adds cost, or being more careful about the crucible purity, which will add cost as well. <laughs>
over here, Rob, Alison. Um, following on from Oyang's question about bifaciality, um, Longji recently announced that they thought within, 50, within five years that they will be producing only IBC. So does that mean they don't think bifaciality is important or valuable? Um, good question. <laughs> uh, I can't a answer on behalf of Longji, <laughs> but um, I, I would have thought that bifaciality will remain important. Yeah, because it gives you an extra 15 up to 20% on your yield, uh, energy yield, when the module's deployed in the field. So depending on the albedo and the like, so um, yeah, I, I I'm not I'm not as sure about that as long as you are. Yeah, I can understand from a rooftop perspective, but if you really um, a large amount in the market is utility. Yeah, so that's a good point. So perhaps you know there'll be some um, some break up of the market. There might be utility scale modules where the bifaciality be really important and rooftop modules where it doesn't matter and then you just go for IBC. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Dan. Um, again, fantastic talk and even the second time I learned a lot. Um, I, I think you pointed at the tandem devices and uh, you said that the TopCon device is still very strongly limited by these lateral transport losses which you don't have in a tandem device. So yes, that's true. do you think that you could optimize a top con cell specifically for applications in, in tandem and thereby get even higher efficiencies? Absolutely. Um, and we're working on that. We have a project on tandem cells with the perovskite guys at the ANU group and we're making poly poly cells. So with poly on the full front and the rear because you don't need to worry about the optical losses so much. And then, yeah, you don't need lateral transport in a, in a two terminal tandem cells, so indeed, um, I think poly is a nice idea and um, you can make it thinner because you don't need the lateral transport. So yes, it'll be a re-optimization, it'll be quite a different looking contact in a tandem cell. The other question I had was on the gathering. You were talking about phosphorus gathering, but in the TopCon device you have a boron diffusion. So is there any particular difference between boron and phosphorus based gathering? Um, is one better than the other? Well, for polysilicon layers, they're both extremely good. Um, both boron and phosphorus dope poly getter iron really well. Um, for diffused silicon, it's not the case. So phosphorus diffused silicon getters iron very well, but boron diffused silicon doesn't, unless you have this boron rich layer on the surface. Uh, but if you leave that there, you can't passivate the surface. So you need to etch that off or oxidize it out during the process. And when you do that, the iron just goes straight back into the wafer. So in the top con cell, where does the gathering happen? In the, in the N plus poly, in the phosphorus doped poly. Or if you were to use P plus poly, that would still get a very, very well. But in, a, in the standard top con cell, the boron diffusion at the front is not doing any gathering at all. Oh, very nice talk, Dan. Um, what do you think about P-type wafers like Longi as well as the 26.8 on N-type? They've got 26.6 on P-type wafers and they have uh, commercialised an IBC cell on um, P-type wafers with you know, 25 plus percent uh, cell efficiency in production and apparently quite high yields. So um, do you think the P-type can match the N-type ultimately? Yeah, um, I didn't talk about P-type here. Um, but I, yeah, I think, I think that's still in the game. I think P-type still could be um, a good option and, and the, the nice results from Fraunhofer as well with the rear junction P-type cell. I think that's a really an interesting architecture as well, even for industrial applications. In our experience, P-type wafers always have a bit of an injection dependence in the carrier lifetime at lower injection levels. And, um, that can still impact the fill factor a bit. But you know, it depends on where you're getting your wafers from. The ones we measure aren't great, but obviously Longji have got their hands on some really, really good P-type wafers. So if, if and they really are, I guess now, the world leaders in ingot growth. If they've figured out how to make P-type wafers that are as good almost as N-type, then yes, I think P-type all of a sudden becomes 
uh, interesting again. Yeah, so it would be a way of getting rid of that uh, boron problem with the with the top cone if you had the rear junction structure. And yep. Also, you know, as uh, Fraunhofer have demonstrated in their um, top cone work. Yeah, indeed. Um, so um, apparently, uh, Longji, I just heard this this morning from Zebo, one of our researchers here, that Longji have now made one and a half gigawatts of that uh, IBC based on a, a PERC plus an N-type top con rear contact. Right. And are planning to uh, do 30 gigawatts next year. So they're, they're um, investing quite heavily in P-type, I guess. Gee, okay, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I think in terms of global capacity in the industry, heterojunction is probably at around 50 gigawatts or something now, whereas Topcon's more like 300. So there's a big difference there. Um, and I, I think, you know, with the amorphous silicon contacts, they're not as easy to engineer as the polysilicon ones. What we've found with the polysilicon contacts is it doesn't really matter how you grow the oxide, deposit the silicon or dope it, you'll get a good result. Whereas with the heterojunctions, you know that it's not just two layers. It's not just one intrinsic layer and then one dope layer. They have three different intrinsic layers and then two or three different dope layers with different um, densities to really optimise the surface passivation. Uh, and that takes a lot of really skillful engineering. I think it's hard for new players to get into that space. Harder than Topcon. Yeah, it's really quite intricate. I actually reviewed that paper that you mentioned oh, yeah. uh, by Longi, and um, actually in news and views, you know, sort of a sort of a brief description of the important things um, just being published by um, Nature Energy that I, that I wrote. Um, and I got a lot of extra information from Longi when I was preparing that, but as you say, there's three layers within the intrinsic layer in that. And interestingly, the one in contact with the silicon interface is silicon dioxide rather than, you know, amorphous silicon dioxide rather than amorphous silicon, and then two layers of different types of amorphous silicon on top of that. Okay. You know, all just a couple of nanometers thick. Yeah. And then the, um, you know, instead of using amorphous silicon for the P and N type regions, they're using uh, microcrystalline or nanocrystalline uh, silicon, so hydrogen rich during the deposition, to, um, uh, you yeah, know, and that gives them better contacting and, uh, and I guess, trans uh, transparency in the layers. And the top one is, is oxygen rich, it's a silicon oxide sort of um, N type, N type layer on the top. Um, yeah, so, so it's quite interesting. So there's a lot more information in my news and views that they actually okay. put in the paper. Um, but it, it was, yeah, I think it just came out last <laughs> week or something like that. Yeah, so there's a lot more information than actually in the paper, but it was based on stuff that I'd seen them present at conferences and so on that they didn't include in the, actually they didn't include the 26.8% result in that Nature paper initially so that I, I got them, to, I think they were planning to do a separate publication on it but I got them to put it into that. Okay, great. Good job. Good time for one or two more questions if anyone has any. Oliver? Thanks Diane. Great talk. I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I've got a question. As you indicated, sort of the gap is not very big between these two technologies. Both give very high efficiencies and in the future maybe even closer. So can you comment maybe a little bit on the vulnerability of these technologies in the field to degradation? Because if they're already pretty close, then anything that one has an advantage over the other may actually be a really big deal. Yep, no, that's a great question. I think when you've got a a solar cell that's at 740, 750 millivolts, you're very, very sensitive to any surface degradation. Um, and you know, there is some evidence out there that, that heterojunction modules do degrade in voltage uh, over their lifetime, and that's probably due to the surface passivation. Um, and that's a bit different to the way other modules have degraded in the field. But yeah, I look, I don't have uh, an opinion on which one's likely be, to be better in that respect, but I think it's a really important topic that we're, it's going to be important that we keep a good eye on that and it's a good research topic for people for the next few years to really look at the in the field stability of those technologies given that they're at such high voltages now. Yeah. 
All right. Well, if there's no further questions, let's thank Daniel again. Thank you. And uh, have a good afternoon. <laughs>